because we've got some exciting topics to discuss today. We're going to be learning about uh, two sections. There, there are actually four sections um, on the ACT, uh, but we're going to be learning about two of those sections today. So why is the ACT important and what is it? Um, has anyone heard of the ACT? I know some of you have taken the ACT. Uh, can someone tell me why it's important for us? Why are we learning about the ACT? Let's hear from Brittany. Brittany, why are we learning about the ACT? Because um, we have to take it. That's right. That's that's one good reason. Uh, as Upward Bound participants, you are required to take the ACT twice. And what good would it do if we were to require you to do something and not prepare you to do it? Uh, so we're we're going to get you ready for that ACT because it is kind of a tough test. Um, you're going to take it twice throughout high school. Um, once, preferably, like towards the end of your junior year and then again at the beginning of your senior year. Or you, you can take it earlier than that if you want, but that's we want you to wait so that you have plenty of um, knowledge that you've gained from, from your high school years. Um, but we are going to be covering math today and English. There are four sections. Two of them are basically the same. Um, we're going to cover those uh, next week, and those are reading and science. Unfortunately, for those of you who love science, the ACT science section does not cover a lot of science. It's mostly reading uh, uh, charts and graphs and kind of analyzing data. Um, so, so that's why we're going to cover those two together. But today we're going to cover again math and English. Uh, Kaylee's going to help us uh, learn about English um, here in a little bit, but we're going to start off with some math. So I'm going to share my screen really quick which is why you need your calculators and the scratch paper. Let me, let me try that again. I'm going to share my entire screen. All right. So that you guys can see the slideshow and uh, my scratch paper over here, which is, uh, going to be a little rough, but I hope you bear with me. I'm not as cool as Mr. Babcock. I don't have a smart board in my office, uh, so I can't work out the problems that way. So we're just going to work it out in paint. Uh, so anyway, mathematics. Um, let me do this. The basics of the math test. Okay, so there are 60 multiple choice questions and you have about 60, not about, you have exactly 60 minutes uh, for this test. So someone do the math for me really quick. Uh, just shout it out. How many, about how many minutes do you spend on each question? One. One, that is correct. Thank you. Uh, you have about a minute per question. Now, the good news is they, they go, uh, from easy to more difficult. So you can answer the easy ones probably quicker than a minute per question. Um, but again, there's no penalty for wrong answers. If you've never heard of the ACT, if you have not taken the ACT, this is one of the most important things you can know about the ACT is that you should answer every single question. You should not leave a single answer blank on the ACT because you're going to get it wrong if you leave it blank. And there's no penalty for wrong answers. So even if you do get it wrong by guessing, it does not hurt your score. You will only have the chance of possibly guessing the right answer and then improving your score. So always guess on every question uh, for the ACT. Do your best to answer as many as you can in the time allowed, but do not leave any blank. Uh, calculator is allowed on this test. They say that it's not needed. You can answer every question on the ACT without a calculator. Um, is it going to take you longer than 60 minutes to do that? Probably. So I would bring a calculator. And if you don't, if you're not sure what calculator is allowed, because they, they, they only allow certain types of calculators, we, we can help provide you with a calculator for that ACT test. Um, but again, as I said before, the questions increase in difficulty. So you start off with easy questions 
and they get harder as they go. And that's what we're going to work on today. We're going to, we're going to learn uh, some of the types of questions that they have on the ACT for math. All right, some do's and don'ts. Before we get to the math questions, uh, I want to see if anybody can give me the answer to this question. Uh, to work out problems, make sure to blank, fill in the blank. Is it A, B, C, or D? Who thinks that they have an answer? If we don't have any, oh, I heard somebody say something. What is it? D. D is correct. D is correct. Use your test booklet and a number two pencil. They will tell you to bring your own pencils um, to the test uh, and make sure they're not mechanical. They do not want Eversharps um, used on the test. They have to be a number two pencil with an eraser at the end um, so that you can erase if, if you accidentally fill in the wrong oval. Um, but that, that is correct. You cannot bring scratch paper um, and they will sit you uh, where you're supposed to sit. So there's no sitting really close to anybody. They, they have de designated seats um, where you're going to sit. Uh, and phones are absolutely not allowed at the ACT. They will take it away you may get your test taken away and thrown out uh, if you have your phone out. All right, when you come across a word problem, what do you do? Just Anybody? Just I'm sorry, just which one? I heard somebody say something. B. B is the correct answer. Read through it carefully and eliminate information. A lot of times in word problems, they give you more information than, than you need. Um, so you need to make sure that you're paying attention to what exactly the information is uh, that you need to answer the question. All right, last do's and don'ts. Because you have 60 minutes, you should do all of the following except, now they have these types of questions on the ACT where they want you to pick the wrong answer uh, instead of which one is right. So there are, there are actually three right answers on here and one wrong answer. Which one of these is the wrong answer? A. A, that is correct. You cannot spend as long as you need for each question. If you come to a question that you are Noticing you're spending longer than a minute or it's taking you, it's going to take you another five minutes to get done with the problem, or you just don't know what to do with that problem, fill in an oval for it and skip it and then come back to it later. You can always come back to questions and change your answer, but do not spend more time than you need for each question. All right. This is an example of uh, an ACT math question and these are some steps that I want you to think of when you're, when you're coming across any problem. You need to determine first what is being asked. Um, sometimes they'll say the question is, uh, they'll, they'll give you some measurements in inches and they'll say how many, uh, or what, what is the total in feet? So you need to make sure that you're not giving the answer in inches because they're asking for feet. So in this, in this case, this problem, what is being asked is 8% of 60 is one fifth of what number? So we need to find a number that is a fifth, or, or excuse me, a fifth of our number is 8% of 60. So you have to be very careful about what exactly is being asked. Another strategy is uh, plug in C. So if you're not sure where to even begin, just plug in C to the, to the problem and see if that fits. Um, I'm gonna reduce my screen really quick. Well, that gave you the answer, uh, <laughs> but uh, we're, we're gonna plug in C really quick to see what number, so if we have 8%, does anyone know how to write 8% as a decimal? 0 0.08. Very good, 0 0.08 of 60, 
So how do I get 8% of 60? What does of mean basically in this problem? Multiply. That's exactly right. 8% of 60 equals, because is means equals in this case. If you're writing out an equation, it's very helpful to know what words mean uh, what uh, math symbols. So of usually means multiply, is usually means equals. Is one fifth of what number? And what did we say of means multiply? So I'm just gonna put it in parentheses because that's the same thing as multiplying of what number? And we'll just use X. Sorry, my handwriting in paint is terrible, um, but we'll make the best of it. Um, so if we're gonna plug in C, if we just don't even know where to begin, we could solve this problem, work it out easily. Um, but if we wanna plug in C really quick um, and see what we get, we'll find that these two sides are not equal. Uh, so that, that should tell us though, which, which way we need to go. Do we need a higher number in X or a lower number in X? And the problems, the math problems are always listed in order from lowest to highest. So if we know that we need a number that's greater than C, then that eliminates three of our problems right there, uh, or three of our answers. Um, so it's either D or E. Um, but if, if we work this problem out, 8% of 60, so we have 0 0.08 times 60 is actually 4.8. I'm gonna drag this down here for a second. So we have now 4.8 equals 1 fifth X. How do I get rid of this 1 fifth to make this just X? Is it by 5 over 1? You can multiply by 5 over 1 or divide by 1 fifth. And anytime you divide by a fraction, you're right, Alyssa. It's, I think that was Alyssa. I can't see, sorry. That's the same as multiplying by the opposite, the reciprocal of the fraction. So if this is 5 over 1, that's basically the same as just saying 5. Anything over 1 is itself. So 5 times 4.8 is going to be 24. And that's our answer. I can math. Very good, very good. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to clear my board here. All right, we're gonna move on to the next. We said our answer was 24. Okay, prime numbers can only be divided by themselves in one. So how many of the following five numbers are prime? Anybody have a guess? Four. Four. Let's check our answer. Two. So let me give you a hint about prime numbers. One is not a prime number. One is actually something else entirely. It's, it's not a prime number. Two is the first prime number and it's actually the only even prime number because any other even number can be divided by two. So obviously it cannot only be divided by themselves and one. Whoops, excuse me. Um, so two is a prime number. 19, can anything go into 19 besides itself and one? No. So 19 is a prime number. 39, what goes into 39? Three. Three goes into 39. And it goes in there 13 times. Uh, so 13 also goes into 39. What about 49? Does anything go into 49? Seven. Seven. Yes, that is correct. So, so these two are automatically out. Something goes into them. Uh, and one, just remember, one is not a prime number. The first prime number is two. So only two of these are prime numbers. All right, order of operations. You've learned these from Mr. Babcock is PEMDAS, um, which stands for parentheses, exponents, multiply, divide, add, and subtract. 
Uh, I'm not going to work this out with you guys because I think you can all figure this one out. If we, if we start with parentheses, get rid of the parentheses, this becomes four. Um, and we have an exponent as well. So that also becomes four. And then it's just a matter of working out the problem. The answer is zero. I hope everyone got that uh, by looking at this. Uh, it's, it's fairly straightforward. You just follow the, the order of operations. Uh, multiply and then divide and then add and subtract. All right, least common multiple. That is uh, also sometimes you see it written as LCM. The least common multiple is the lowest number that both of these numbers divide into. Okay, so what is the least common multiple of eight and 16? A number but that both of these will go into. Anybody have an answer? 32. For this one? 32. That would, upon first glance, yes, that makes sense because eight goes into 32, 16 goes into 32. Is there a number that 16 goes into that eight goes into as well that is 16. less than 32? 16, yes, yeah, 16 goes into 16 one time. So 16 is our least common multiple. A, a similar uh, thing to least common multiple is greatest common factor, which is the greatest number that divides into both. So rather than going up, you're going down, if that makes sense. Uh, with least common multiple, you're, you're trying to find the number that they both go into that is higher um, or, or equal to. This, you're, you're trying to find a number that is less than uh, or equal to. So is there a number uh, which, which makes no sense whatsoever because least mm -hmm. common multiple you're, you're, you think would be smaller, but it's actually bigger. Okay, greatest common factor. That's the, that's the clue word right there, factor. A factor is something that goes into these numbers. So I think I heard somebody say it, three. three. It's actually six. If you take six times three, you get 18, and six times five, you get 30. So six is the greatest common factor that goes into both of these. They're not asking for the least common factor, uh, which actually would be two, um, but the greatest common factor. What's the biggest number that will go into both of those? Rational radicals. Okay, so looking at these here, these are all radical uh, answers. And I don't mean that they're radical as in like way far out cool. I, I mean that they have this little line that comes up that's a square root symbol, but it's also called a radical. Um, so this is radical three, this is radical 13, this is radical pi. Uh, which of these following numbers is a rational number? Now irrational, the difference between irrational and rational Irrational is just a bunch of random numbers that goes on forever and ever and ever. Rational is an even fraction or a decimal that repeats itself. And we can see that the answer is E because if you take, let me exit really quick, a radical 25 over 36, Anytime you see a division symbol inside of a radical, that's the same thing as saying radical 25 over radical 36. Can anyone tell me what radical 25 is? without using your calculator. What was it? Five. Five, very good. So the square root or the radical uh, 25, the square root of 25 is five. And the square root or radical 36. Six. Is six, very good. So five, six, that's an even fraction. It does not go on forever, it does not repeat. Uh, or sorry, excuse me, it's not an irrational decimal that goes on forever. Five-sixths is an even fraction.
Okay, so that is a rational number. All right, we're going to go back to the slideshow. I think this is the last one. I'm not sure. Um, percents. So to find the percent of something, we talked about this before um, with the, the one of the original problems we had, we had 8% of 60. Uh, you divide the part out of the whole. So if you're thinking of your grade for a class, if you got 20 points out of 25 points, that would be that your percentage would then be the, the part that you got right out of the whole, 20 out of 25. Um, and then multiply that fraction or that decimal by 100 to get your percentage. So let's see if we can find the percentage uh, here. A concert ticket usually costs $75, but it is on sale for 45% off. What is the final sales price of the ticket? This is an example, a, a great example of an ACT question. They're going to ask you for a percentage off of something and then they're going to ask you what is the final sales price. So I want everyone to try to work this problem out. I'm going to call on someone and see if they can figure out what the answer is to this problem. Let's see who we got here. Um, give you a couple more seconds here. Sorry, I'm covering up the problem. So it costs $75 on sale for 45% off. What is the final sales price of the ticket? Uh, let's hear from Anya Sophia, do you have the answer? C. You believe it is C. No, I... no, D. I said D. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, <laughs> D is is the correct answer. Um, how did you get that, Anya Sophia? Um, forty-five percent of seventy-five is thirty-three point seventy-five, and then you minus that out of seventy-five. Okay, very good. So for those of you that uh, did not catch that, I would start by taking what is 45% of 75. So you have 0.45 times $75. And she said that that was how much? Thirty-three point seven five. 33.75. That's one of our answers. They're going to do that to you. They're going to try to trick you and, and think that you're done with the problem, but you're not. Um, so, so if 45% is off of the total price, we would then subtract 33.75 minus 75. And that's going to give us the 41.25, which is the final sales price. All right, I think that is the last problem. So we're going to do one quick problem from, I don't have to use this anymore, I don't think. Um, this is another type of problem that you'll get a lot. It's called a proportions problem. Um, Marcus's favorite casserole recipe requires three eggs and makes six servings. Marcus will modify the recipe by using five eggs and increasing all other ingredients in the recipe proportionally. Right there, proportionally. They, they told you that this is a proportions problem. Every proportions problem is set up the same way. Um, whether you're saying, okay, I have a, a shape here and this side is four and then I have the same proportional shape where the side is now eight. So if I'm trying to figure out what, what side, if this side was six, what side is this going to be now? This is the same type of problem. It's a proportion problem. 
where, where you have one given set of measurements and you're trying to figure out a second set of measurements where it's about the same, it's supposed to remain proportionate. Uh, so how would we set this up? Does anyone remember how we set up a proportion problem? I know we've talked about it before, but if you don't remember, that's okay. A proportion problem is set up like this. It's set up like a fraction. So if there are three eggs for every six servings, and you may, you may find yourself doing this when you make a recipe. You may need to make a recipe someday for someone and you need to know how many uh, eggs you'll need or how, how much of a certain ingredient you'll need uh, to change the serving size. So you set it up like this, two fractions on either side of an equal sign. So if I have three eggs that makes six servings, and then we know that Marcus will modify the recipe by using five eggs. So I need to make sure that I write eggs on the same side of the fraction. Uh, I wrote eggs on the top of the fraction last time, so I'm gonna keep it on the top. What is the total number of servings that, we, that we'll need to make? Um, so all you need to do now is cross multiply. So you'll get three X equals 30. Divide this by three on both sides, X equals 10. Now some of you probably were able to figure that out in your head because they saw that three eggs made six servings, which is double. So five eggs would make double the amount of servings, which is 10. So our answer here is C. Now there's all kinds of problems that we could work out. We're gonna do some practice, uh, more practice in the fall with ACT, but we just wanna give you a little brief um, introduction because the more that you're familiarized yourself with it, the easier it becomes. So you may think, man, this is like going way over my head. I don't know any of this. Even if you remember one or two things from what we talked about today, it's gonna to be tremendously beneficial for you. Um, when it comes to ACT time, because all of those things that you've learned over the whole course of your program um, or, or through your high school years will, will compound. Um, so we're going to jump over now. I'm going to stop sharing. I think that is given just enough time uh, for Kaylee. Uh, she's going to come over and give uh, some instruction on the English uh, section of the ACT. Okay. All right, Dan. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> Yay, Matt. Yay, Matt. <laughs> Yay, Matt. I'm trying to. All right, did that work? It's starting. Yep. There we go. Okay. Okay, the English section of ACT. Uh, I personally found this section. Um, easiest, but I'm better at English than the other subjects. So uh, it is 75 multiple cho choice questions. It's 45 minutes. There's no penalty for wrong answers. And there's, so just answer every question. Even if you maybe don't know, just pick the best one, the one you think is the best answer. And it is uh, always better than leaving it blank. It's broken into five passages that you'll have to read and answer the questions and each passage has about 15 questions to it. And you need to spend about um, eight to nine minutes per passage that includes reading it and answering the questions in order to try and get them all done by the end of the time. The do's and don'ts of the English pass, uh, section, when in doubt, here are four things. Who who thinks which one is? I can't get this to get bigger. Just a second. Okay. A shortest is best. B ask for help from the person next to you. C pick an answer at random. Or D use your phone to Google it. What are our guesses? C. Emily says C. Um. Okay, that 
if it's if it, that's your last resort, that's not a bad answer, but it's actually a um, shortest is best. I guys, I wish I knew this when I was in high school taking the ACT because sometimes you'll get an answer. We'll we'll see an example in a second, but you'll get it'll be a super long answer, and you'll be like, that looks right. But really, what they're looking for is the shortest answer is the best answer. Okay, so whenever you're like reading the que the question, the answers, and they're really long and involved, it's probably not one of them. Okay, when reading passages, do all of the following except, so this is like Dan was telling you earlier, you've got to read this very carefully because it's asking you which one is not correct. Um, is it read one paragraph at a time, skip from question to question, eliminate obviously wrong answers, or test no change or delete, delete omit? Which one do you think that is? A. It's actually B. So it's asking which one do you not do? So don't skip from question to question because if you're gonna, we'll look at the example again in a second. It, that would be really confusing to do because if you don't go in chronological order as you're reading, then you get really confused and you don't wanna skip around. That makes it really confusing. It'll make more sense in a second when we do one. Because this section does not get more difficult as you go along, like the math one gets becomes more difficult. Um, uh, you should do one of these things. Spend a long time on each question, skip around, illustrate each passage in your textbook, but pace yourself and answer every question. What do you think this is? D? Yes, D. D is correct. Because it's the same, you have the same amount of time. So just pace yourself, do the best you can. Don't have to worry about speeding up to get to the end. Okay, sentence fragments, sentence, where, this screen here. Um, a sentence is a complete thought, right? Everyone remembers this from basic English. So it has a subject and a verb in it. So one of these questions they're gonna, so you'll read through this paragraph. It says trees are frequent conductors of lightning to the ground. If the damage is severe, the tree may not be able to recover and decay sets in, eventually killing the tree. So the underlined portion is what they're asking you about. So it says, occasionally may explode completely. Now, first of all, reading that, does that sentence make sense to anyone? No, because there's no, there's no, there's not a complete sentence. Um, there's no verb. So, or subject. So, Four is saying, would you change, there's no change. Four, G, occasionally, comma, a tree may completely, that's still not a sentence. H, occasionally, comma, may explode. Or J, occasionally, a tree may explode completely. So which one of those sounds the most complete? J. J, very good. So when in doubt, just read it read that and they're wanting a complete sentence and if it doesn't make sense it's not correct so then you can go on and read you want to go on and read i know some of it may be tempting to skip through the next sentences but it, that the next question might not make sense if you don't continue reading that whole passage okay oh jay sorry okay one another one they might ask about is punctuation commas introductory phrases and afterthoughts. So in the 1980s, as large commercial companies began to use TCP IP to build private internets. Okay, so you could kind of pause and look at what they're trying to ask you. Five is saying, would you change it? Would you put a comma after large? Um, a comma after the 1980s? and a comma after 1980s and D, but they leave out the word as. So you could put it in there and say, like for instance, say you think it's D, you put in the 1980s comma large commercial companies, or in the 1980s comma as large commercial companies begin to use. And you could just put it in to see what makes sense. So uh, who thinks, what, what do you think five would be, A, B, C, or D? Veronica says J. Oh, that, no, that was for the last one. Hey, I gave you the answer. It's C. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I clicked on it. Um, you don't want to take out the, the as because it wouldn't make the next sentence 
logical, okay? So in the 1980s, comma. So when you're reading a sentence, read it like you would read it like in your head. And if you naturally put a pause there, there's probably a comma. So you would say in the 1980s, as large com commercial companies, so I kind of pause right there, there would be a comma. Okay, six, so you go down and read, ARPA investigated transmission of multimedia, audio, video, and graphics across the internet. Other groups investigated hypertext and created tools such as Gopher that allowed users to browse menus that are lists of possible options. Okay, so they put a comma on G after list, so menus which are lists, comma, of possible options. Menus, comma, which are lists of pop possible options. And menus, colon, semicolon, which are lists of possible options. So this one is a little bit tough because you think like, well, first of all, they changed one of the words. They changed that to which, and then they added a different punctuation in there. So who thinks they might know what this one is? Anyone can guess. Anyone guess or I'm gonna choose on you? I'm checking the chat, but I don't see anything. H? Okay, Melissa says H possibly. So you, you think menus, comma, which are lists of possible options. The answer is at, ooh, is H. Very good. So because when you're reading it, it says um, created tools such as Gopher that allow users to browse, menu, browse menus, which are lists of possible options. Because which um, sounds better than that. I don't, Dan, do you have a, a easier these, way? These of, are just examples of like, uh, I guess they're sentence fragments or clause, independent clause, uh, dependent clauses that, that cannot function on their own. So which are lists of possible options is not a sentence. It needs a comma to separate it from the rest of the sentence, um, which it would makes it an afterthought. Um, same thing with in the 1980s, that's an introductory phrase. So sometimes if, you, if you're reading something and it makes sense to pause, uh, after in the 1980s, um, you would put a comma there. Sometimes uh, you, you do the same thing at the end of a sentence. Um, yeah, and, and they, they put, they change that to which is because it fits the sentence better. Um, so that's why it makes it a little bit tricky because you think maybe it's no change, but then these three examples have which in it. So you just got to kind of look, they're trying to throw you off. So yes. you've got you to look at um, the commas with the extra things that they put in them. Um, punctuation in interruptions and a positives. So when I nominated Sigmund Freud, the father of psychoanalysis, my friends just groaned and rolled their eyes. So um, you can have no change, or when I nominated Sigmund Freud, comma, the father of psychoanalysis, comma, or when, comma, I nominated Sigmund Freud, the father of psychoanalysis, comma, or when I nominated, comma, Sigmund Freud, the father of psychoanalysis. So, to me, like, as I'm reading through those sentences, um, you just have to read it as you would naturally read it and then notice where you pause. So right. who, who's, re, who's hearing what I just read and who thinks that they know what the answer might be? We've got several in the chat that said G. Okay. Ah, guys, G. Okay, very good. Uh, the difference between that is they put a, a comma after psychoanalysis, which makes sense. Yeah. There's a, a natural pause there. That's good an job. interruption, right. It's, it, mm -hmm. it, it's just the same thing as what comes at the beginning of the sentence or at the end of the sentence, the, those kind of, those little clauses, those fragments that wouldn't make sense by themselves, but they're, they're kind of interspersed in there somewhere with, and they're separated by commas. Okay, punctuation commas, coordinate, adjectives, lists, and conjunctions. Okay, 
So this one is asking you to put the commas in. It doesn't have any commas in it and they wanna know how many you think would be in there. So in reading this, these two sentences, the lazy brown fox slept the day away and the rabbits played outside its den while the fox dreamt of flowers, streams, and sunshines. So first of all, the, the first thing you need to look at is, would you ever start a sentence with and? Anyone? No. Okay, so that's kind of a trick because you're like, oh, there's two sentences here. Well, there's not. Um, it's probably a comma. So there's one right there. Instead of the period, there's a comma right there. So that's a, that's a, a good indication of a comma. Another one is descripti descriptors. So uh, lazy and brown. So you would put a comma between them because there's two there and you have to separate them with a comma. So who? how many commas after reading that do you think are in this three. sentence. Okay, someone said three. Okay, there's actually four. So a lazy brown fox slept the day away, comma, and the rabbits played outside its den, well, den, comma, while the fox dreamt of flowers, streams, and sunshine. I actually might have done that wrong. Okay, I actually added an extra comment in there. This, guys, I'm not saying, this is pretty tough. So the more practice you can get with the ACT, the better, yeah. okay? Yeah. So one, one comma after lazy, one after away, and since flowers and streams are um, a nouns, a right. list, you put commas after them. And ACT, does anyone know what an Oxford comma is? So there's a lot of um, confusion about this one. It's a comma right before the word and, like, streams comma and so sometimes people put it in there and sometimes people don't but the ac2 uses it so you would count that as a comma right okay grammar which is everyone's favorite thing ever yay <laughs> so there's a lot of different grammar um questions they'll have on the act in this this particular uh, review we're doing we're doing it's it's and it's there there and there two two and two uh, which some of them might be pretty obvious but some are confusing so this paragraph says there are several ways to use words in the english language okay what is they they i'm going to say it anyway they comma are there with a comma is they are so if you read the sentence and it says they are very several there are they are several ways to use words does that make sense it does not make sense so obviously that's the wrong there so which there would it be i cannot see t-h-e-i-r or t-h-e-r-e -E. the second the second one. Correct. Yes, good. Yes, because there is a place or location I saw over there. I should have gone over those first. Let's do that. It's is a contraction of it is. It's with no comma is a possessive form. The arrow hit its mark. And it's with apostrophe, not comma, apostrophe. It's with an apostrophe after the S is not an actual word, okay? But the ACT is going to throw it in there to throw you off. So if you see the apostrophe at the end of it's, you know it's wrong right off the bat, okay? Never pick that answer. <laughs> yeah. There, T-H-E-I-R is more than one owner. It was their dog. There is a place of location. They, comma, apostrophe, R-E is they are, contraction. And two, two this one, these, these are confusing for a lot of people. Uh, T-O is a movement in a direction. Let's go to the store. T-O-O -O is also or a lot. So sometimes that works if you just, um, if you place replace two with also and it makes sense, then it's probably two O's. I mean, it is two O's. There are two or too many choices. There are a lot of choices, okay? And T-W-O is obviously the number two. I see a lot of people confusing T-W-O with other things and it's spelled differently. So you guys should know that that's not the same thing. Okay, so um, English language and it's often difficult too. 
So which it's would that be? Because that's obviously not a word. It is. Yes, it is at the contraction. And then often difficult, not the number two, but is it T-O or T-O-O? Anyone? Eve. Is it T-O or is it T-O-O? It's often difficult to. It's T-O. Which one? Wait, would it be T-O? Yeah, two, two O's because you can put the word also in there. It is off, off, often difficult also. So it's two O's, okay? Um, make sure you know which one is proper because it's confusing. So would that be the correct it's in that situation? Ah, you guys, I'm sorry. <laughs> means to be it is because mm -hmm, it is confusing so it it apostrophe s when they're used correctly and there is not um more than one owner so which there should that be apostrophe for re yes good they are used incorrectly overall a good rule of thumb is to check so I can't say overall good rule of thumb is also is well you could is a lot check. You can't say that. So which two is that? T O. Yeah. For a contraction, decide if you're speaking. And I threw that one in there. Uh, yep. it's not it's not you are mentioned. Yep. It's yes, a possibility yes. because it's you Very are good. good. Very good. More than one thing and find out if there is ownership. Is that there correct? <laughs> Everyone's second no. guessing themselves now. Yeah. <laughs> e I R. Um, I actually think that is correct. No, that is not. correct. That is that, correct. Yeah. Okay, that is the correct one. That was a trick. That because you trick. can't put there because it's not people, and you can't put they are because it's not a contraction. Okay. Right. The ACT is trying to trick you. Is that the correct two? Does it make sense to say the ACT is also trick you, trying also trick you? So it would be T-O. T -O. So don't second guess yourself, but reread to be sure its usage is accurate, accurate and that's a trick word. So is it apostrophe S or just S? Just S. Good. And then the correct. Yeah, and then that's the corrected pair, what we just did. Good. Oh, that's the last slide. Okay, so now we're going to. Reading that made me mad. I know, Elizabeth. It's like you have to like you have to overanalyze it, and that's what the ACT is. And sometimes you just need to. It's easier when you are actually taking the test because, let me show you an example passage really quick. And there's not so many distractions around. You're in a quiet room, and it's just you and your paper focusing on the test. Like there are other people in the room with you, but you're not talking to anybody. No one's looking around. Right, and it's also easier. That's why- When we, they, when we took it, the room was freezing. People were sneezing and coughing. The ground was like slanted in, and I kind of had like had to sit there and try and keep myself in the seat. Yeah, <laughs> so, so that's a, tiny. a good reason why it, it's a good idea to take it more than once, okay? Because yeah. A, the first time you take it is you're nervous, you don't know what to expect. I mean, you guys will know what to expect because you're you're getting practice through upper bound, but um, you're, you won't be so jittery. And then if you know you don't take a good, um, take the test very well in that environment, then you can request to take it in a different location. And maybe it's a, it's a better environment and it works better for you. Okay, because there are several locations 
you can take it at a, a whole bunch of different schools. Like you don't have yeah. to sign up for the one in your town. So, or take it a different time of year. If it's winter and it's freezing, you don't like it, take it in the summer next time, which summer they say is easier. Anyway, so. hmm? Or bring a jacket. That's true. But I think, yeah. Okay. So let's do uh, this first passage together really quick. Uh, I know we don't have much time, but um, I'm going to just randomly ask people what they think the answer is. So be ready. Um, so mystery paper sculptor between March and November of 2011, an anonymous donor left intricately crafted paper sculptures at various cultural institutions in Edinburgh, Scotland. Okay, so number one is asking which choice most effectively emphasizes the complexity of the paper sculptures. Now this one is, is already tricky off the bat because you look at these other words and you think they would fit in that situation. But you need to think about the one that fits um, the best, is most effective for that sentence. So... And what is, I think... The, the, the clue in this question is complexity too. Yes. Right? So, so which, which one of these words describes something that could also be very complex? Yes. So uh, Malachi, what do you think that one is? A, B, C, or D? A. Okay. That is, yes, that is, that is, that is correct because intricate means complex. Okay. So yes. that's what, they're going for in that in that first one. Good Malachi. Okay, delighted. Each sculpture was left secretly and was later discovered by staff. So two, would you the, and this is where the rule shortest is best comes in because all of these answers are longer than the original sentence. So Jenna, what do you think number two is? Would it be F? Okay. Ah, I led you astray on that one. I'm sorry, guys. It's actually G. Um, I'm sorry. Okay, because delighted is is talking. They're saying delighted is applying to each sculpture, and it's actually applying right. to the staff. I'm sorry. That was my bad. So because they put delighted first, it's incorrect because they're saying each sculpture was left secretly and later discovered by delighted staff. That was my right. Point. Because delighted describes staff, not each right. sculpture. Right. right. Okay. The delicate sculptures, streetscaped plants and animals were carved exclusively from the pages and bindings of books. The tiny details in the pieces are awe-inspiring. Okay. The first sculpture discovered at the Scottish Poetry Library was a tiny tree formed from a book or of verse. Library staff dubbed it the poetry. Okay. So who thinks they know what number three is? No change, specified, adorned, or honored. Uh, rain. Um, B. Okay, so if you put um, Library staff specified it, the poetry, that doesn't sound quite right. So it actually, it's actually A, okay? They just leave it because that word works great there, okay? If you aren't sure what a word means, um, at least eliminate the ones that you know for sure that it can't be. Um, and and usually they'll, they'll try to trick you by throwing three words out there that seem that almost exactly the same um, as the word that they're trying to get you to change. So if, if none of the words seem to be better than the original word, just keep it the same because yeah. I think it, I think it's, I, I don't remember the exact statistic, but no change is an answer as often as anything else. Yeah. At Edinburgh's Filmhouse Cinema, a three-dimensional sculpted scene shows patrons sitting. Okay, so, um, okay, is it cinema, comma, a three-dimensional sculpted scene? Is it cin cinema, comma, a three-dimensional sculpted, comma, scene? Cinema, a three-dimensional sculpted scene, comma, or cinema, a three-dimensional, comma, sculpted, comma, scene? 
if there are that many uh, commas in the sentence, that's it's too many commas. Like, okay, so when in especially doubt, if leave it, the comma out. Yeah. yeah, it's not listing anything. So um, let's go up the list here, Elizabeth. Number four. What do you think it is? No change. No change. Good job. Okay, it shows patrons sitting in a movie theater as horse leaps out of the screen. Okay, I, when you're reading that one, it already kind of doesn't make sense. So try and read it with the other examples. And which one do you think it is, Alyssa? Yes, correct. A movie theater as horses leap out of the screen. That makes more sense. Very good. Okay, we're going to do one more. At the Scottish Storytelling Center, a dragon crafted from the pages of a mystery novel was found nesting in a window. Okay. Um, so six, is it no change, dragon dash, crafted from the pages, dragon comma, drafted from the pages, comma, or dragon crafted from the pages? Uh, sailor. You read the sentence and it says, a dragon crafted from the pages of a mystery novel. Does that sound right? Or is it one of the other examples? I don't see Sailor. So let's go with Nick. Okay. Anyone who hasn't gone yet? Alyssa raised her hand. Okay. Well, so what do you think it is? G. Six is actually F. It's no change because it it's perfect. G, that dash is not needed. You, you don't need the dash at all. And if okay. you did throw in that dash, you would probably need another dash after novel. Crafted from the pages of a mystery novel, dash, was found nesting in a window. So they, they don't give you that option. Yeah. Um, so yeah, oh, and, and like we said, I mean, half of the questions that we did today were no change. So when in doubt, just go with no change. Most of the time it's, it's gonna be right. Okay, I know this guy, guys, I know this seems, it's really frustrating the first couple of times you do it, um, but really the ACT, practice is helpful because it gets you used to the type of things they ask and it doesn't make you think um, second guess yourself because you you know the stuff okay so I know ACT seems like it's a boring subject but the more you but it can it, get you lots great of money. scholarships yes. yep so think of it as a a job that you're doing part-time you're you're putting in time that will eventually pay off big bucks. So you, you can be earning hundreds of dollars an hour taking the ACT. Yeah. So that, um, I'm sure you'll be going over more of these through Upward Bound. Yes. Yeah. All right. Thank you guys very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. We will see you tomorrow. Don't forget study hall. If you have homework that you need help with, if you need to catch up with anything, we're there at one o'clock every day for study hall. So we'll hope to see you there.